The following recording is fully owned and or licensed to Christians for Biblical Equality International. No reproduction shall be made without prior written consent from CBE. This is a very strange place for me to be. I uh, live uh, working with uh, women's studies or female issues or uh, what on earth you call it, egalitarian and complementarianism. These are new words to me. It's been a, 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 a big uh, steep climb for me to learn all about these issues because I, it's an environment I don't normally work in. I normally work in rabbinic Judaism, as uh, you heard, in first century backgrounds of the New Testament. I try and read the New Testament through the eyes of someone living in the first century because that's the way I believe that we can understand what the text actually says because they're the people that God was speaking to directly and we have to learn through their eyes. But the subject of women is a whole new language to me. I, I, I feel like a fish out of water or uh, perhaps a, a fish without a bicycle, is it? I, I'm not quite sure. I, I didn't even know how to spell compliment, complementarianism. Uh, but my, my wife explained to me. She said, here's a joke. Uh, a man walks into a pub and he goes up to the bar and there's a bowl of peanuts on the bar and it talks to him. And it says, my, you're looking very smart today. And he says, well, uh, thank you. And he turns around and there's a cigarette machine. And the cigarette machine talks to him as well. And it says, you fat slob, what are you doing here? Get out! And, and confused, he turns to the barman and says, I, I don't understand. Your bowl of peanuts is very nice, and your cigarette machine is really nasty to me. He said, let me explain. The peanuts are complimentary. <laughs> the cigarette machine is out of order. <laughs> I was uh, caught up in the, the whole area of complementarianism and egalitarianism uh, when I um, first uh, read uh, a journal which, for which I got a free subscription by some means, I'm not sure how. Uh, you may have heard this journal, um, the Journal for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, I, I, you, I have some fa there's some fans here. Uh, I, I didn't find it all that interesting until one issue came on my desk. Uh, it was almost completely devoted to me. I thought I was very interesting until I read the article. It was devoted to trashing something that I'd written. And it, it wasn't, I, I wrote mainly on um, divorce and remarriage issues. And one paragraph in an academic paper in a journal which not many people read caught their attention. And they spent the whole of that issue taking it to pieces word by word. And I thought, this must be a very important paragraph. <laughs> And so I've done some more work on that paragraph, and that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today. <laughs> so so I, I think we owe them some thanks for highlighting a very important issue which I might have overlooked. And, and I, then out of the envelope uh, fell another piece of paper. It said, Dear Sir, your free trial membership ends with this issue. <laughs> if you found it edifying, please fill in the order form and send in your, your money. <laughs> I think I forgot. Uh, uh, oh, I don't have any nice pictures which uh, are relevant, unlike the previous two speakers. So I thought I'd put the, this. This is my family uh, on a, a lookout post in Germany uh, where we were looking over the Rhine. Isn't that nice? Earlier this year, yes. yes. It's my wife and uh, Joanne and Alice. Yes, very nice. Right, uh, what, what um, we have to... Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Here they are with a couple of tortoises which they wanted to take home from Tunisia and we had to tell them to put them back because it's against the law. The, the questions my daughters ask, when they're about three, they ask the question, why? That's a wonderful question. They're never quite interested in the answer, but it's a wonderful question. <laughs> when they got to a older, about five, they asked, can I have it? <laughs> well, usually they weren't that polite, but that's the gist of what they said. But uh, as they got older, they started asking more uh, fundamental questions. What's it worth? You know, will you do something? What's it worth? Or here's a present. What's it worth? Uh, they, um, and um, as they get older, uh, well, they still have questions, but they don't ask us. <laughs> Isn't that sad? But I'm being asked some new questions. Uh, are you complementarian or are you egalitarian? And I just don't like that question. I don't like to be pigeonholed. Uh, I, 
I don't want the church in the UK to be split over this issue, like I see it in the States. Uh, I see Mimi here nodding away. I asked her permission to say this before, and she said, yes, yes, this is what the organisations here stand for. We don't want the church divided. I don't want to not be able to fellowship with my good friend Wayne Grudem. I don't want to see uh, my other friend who applied for an academic post in this country uh, be turned down because he's a complementarian. I thought that was terrible. He said, I'm not going to be teaching this because I'm not being employed to teach this, but that just happens to be what I am. And they said, well, you're the best person for this post. And in fact, they didn't fill it, merely because of his stand on this issue. And I, I hate to see that. I'm a member of a preaching team. There's three men, one woman. One of those men is a complementarian, and he doesn't make a fuss about it. Just when the woman is preaching, he he worships somewhere else out of conscience sake, but he doesn't say anything about it. And most of the congregation don't realise that that's why he happens not to be there on those Sundays. I think he's a model Christian in do doing it that way. For his conscience sake, he just doesn't turn up on those Sundays. It hurts the woman who's preaching, of course, but uh, she takes it uh, with good strength. We have fantastic freedom when we take the egalitarian road. We have freedom in Christ. There's no male, no female. There's no slave, no free, no Jew, no, no Gentile. But we shouldn't use that freedom to make our brothers and sisters stumble. Okay, that's the preaching over. Uh, then people ask me, was the New Testament egalitarian or complementarian? Well, I'm afraid it's a bit of a dumb, stupid question. It's a bit like asking, was the New Testament charismatic or liturgical? It's both, isn't it? They're both there. And what I'm going to be pointing out this morning is the teaching of the New Testament to Christians is egalitarian. There is no male, no female, no free, no slave. But the New Testament does teach the early church for some reason that women should be submissive to husbands, that children should obey their parents, and slaves should obey their masters. And this morning, I'm going to be looking at why it says that. That's the most interesting question. Why? Because there we find an answer for our generation, what we should be doing now. See, it, the, there were several scandals that the church faced. I'm not going to deal with the scandals of Jesus this morning. I don't have time. But uh, the, there were three great scandals about Jesus. First of all, he was single. And that reminded everyone that he was of illegitimate birth. Uh, we don't like it, but everyone in his generation was calling him a bastard. That was a legal term for him. He wasn't a, um, strictly a bastard in that no one had seen his uh, parents uh, illegally copulating. That was the only way in which you could make him legally a mamzer, a bastard. But uh, no good Jewish uh, man would give his daughter to marry him because everyone could count. They knew he was born less than nine months after the wedding date. Everyone knew it. Uh, you see it in the, the Gospels. You see Matthew and Luke being very, very keen to make sure that everyone knows about the virgin birth. That's what actually happened. But I think that uh, they had a very difficult task trying to get that message across. In John 8, we find what uh, people were really thinking. In John 8, they say, where is your father? And then in verse 41, we weren't born illegitimately. Everyone knew. It was a small place, villages full of gossips. Everyone knew. And that was one of the scandals which Jesus bore for us. That label. The second scandal was that Jesus was crucified. And there was no getting away from that. He was a criminal. And he was the worst of criminals. And every time anyone spoke about the cross, it reminded them that Jesus came from the dirt. And he went back to the dirt. He was crucified, the most terrible punishment imaginable, and uh, reserved only for the worst of criminals. Our church was looking for a new logo. I suggested perhaps the gallows, or the electric chair. That's what the cross is. It's a symbol of execution of the worst criminals. The third scandal was that Jesus allowed women among his disciples. He allowed women to accompany the disciples around on his journeys, and he even allowed women to sit amongst the disciples while he was teaching them. That terrible woman, Mary. Uh, it's amazing uh, that he allowed this, 
And what's worse is the church continued that tradition. So that in the early church you have lots of women in leadership positions. Perhaps not actually being called leaders most of the time, but very much taking up the role of leaders. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus, and other women. They helped to, to choose one of the new apostles. Or Lydia, the first convert in Philippi, leader of a house church. And there are other women leaders of house churches, we assume, because suddenly we get all these house churches meeting in women's houses. Did, were there all these houses belonging to women? Or were the women mentioned because they were actually the leaders of those house churches? And Junia, the, one of the apostles, of course, in most of the manuscripts it says Junias, uh, you can't have a woman apostle, can you? So let's change it to Junias. We've got lots of examples of Junia. We know of 255 women called Junia in Rome, uh, in Rome alone, lots more in, in the rest of the world. We know of no man called Junias. It's, it's a complete fabrication. It's like saying, well, there's this apostle called Elizabeth. Uh, let's call him, uh, let, let's g- give him a male name, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make sense. It's Junior. There's no other way around it. And she was one of the apostles. Uh, we have women praying and prophesying. They weren't silent in church, because they were told to cover their heads when they were praying and prophesying. Obviously, they were doing it. Uh, Philip's four daughters, they prophesied. Not that Paul took any notice of them, but then he didn't take any notice of Agabus, the man, either. You've got some... Um, that women at Pentecost, they were um, full of the Spirit, and they were prophesying, because we're told it was fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And even the female prophet at Thyatira, uh, she's criticized because she's teaching false teaching, but she's not criticized because she's a woman in teaching. She's criticized for having the wrong teaching. And we have Priscilla and Aquila, of course, and we have many other women named among Paul's co-workers. And also immediately after the New Testament, the same trend, you see. Pliny the Younger, when he's interrogating the Christian leaders, he chooses the two Christian leaders. They're two women. And when um, you have the Acts of Paul and Thecla, it's um, an apocryphal uh, story about uh, Paul appointing an apostle over Cilicia, and it happens to be a woman, Thecla. I think it's a made-up story, but the point is, he, the, whoever wrote it thought it was believable. In the church there, you had women apostles. Uh, there's no getting around it. There were women leaders in the early church. And thi- Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Another picture seems to have got it. This is um, with Joanne. Uh, this is uh, a few months ago. I was in a, found this wonderful museum of mosaics in Tunisia. There are more mosaics there from the Roman period than there are in the whole of the UK. It's fantastic. There, there's a statue there of Claudius, the mad Claudius, and uh, I can't remember what we're looking at there on the floor. Wonderful museum. Uh, we, we have to look at the New Testament times, the, the greco roman background, to understand what, what the church was going to do in this situation, because it found itself in an area of scandal. You see, women in the uh, first century were on the up and up. They were gaining new freedoms. Uh, there was what has been called the new Roman woman. I don't know if you've seen the uh, review of Bruce Winter's book in the latest Priscilla issue. Uh, He's brought together a wonderful resource of different texts talking about this new Roman woman and the freedoms that she had. Uh, Freedoms in legal terms, freedoms in uh, financial terms, and freedoms, well, she took the freedom in sexual terms. Uh, It was because of the war, uh, in the uh, Peloponnesian War in the 2nd century BCE, uh, there are lots of men folk got killed, and women were given new freedoms there. They also had some freedoms taken away. In order to pay for the war, they passed a law which said you mustn't spend much money on jewellery and on hairstyles. That's where the men perceived all the money of the empire was being wasted. And so they passed a law that limited the amount of money you could spend on jewellery and hairstyles. And at the end of the war, uh, there, there was a, a, a big rebellion when someone tried to repeal that law when the money was free again, and then the the men didn't want their wives to have the freedom to spend that money again. And Cato said, as soon as they begin to be our equals, they'll be our masters. As soon as the law no longer imposes a limit on your wife's extravagance, you will certainly not be able to impose it yourself. Uh, Cato uh, was very worried, and he represented a large number of men who were worried about their women getting new freedoms. And it got worse. Uh, when Augustus uh, the, was emperor uh, just, before the first, uh, just before the turn, oh, in 19 BCE, 
I, I, excuse me, I say BCE and I say CE, a Christian era, rather than AD, uh, because I often speak to Jews, and Jews get offended when I talk about the year of our Lord. He isn't their Lord yet, and uh, they, they don't like me speaking about the year of our Lord. So I talk about the Christian era. Everyone agrees this is the Christian era. We date from the time of Christ, but we don't all yet bow down to him as Lord. So forgive me if I use those um, uh, terms. Uh, Augustus, he passed the law in um, 19, no, 18 BCE to encourage women to have more babies. And he did that by saying, if you have three babies, you get a free gift. You will be able to represent yourself in court. And this was a big deal because before that, you had to be represented in court by your curios, your lord, your guardian, your legal guardian, which was normally your husband. So you had no freedoms at all to look after your own money, your own property, your own business. But he said, Augustus said, if you have three babies, then you can appoint your own guardian and you've got freedom in court. And this produced more freedom for them. And then the Claudius later, he uh, even got rid of the law uh, needing a guardian. So women had absolute freedom in law. And uh, a lot of the lawsuits, in fact, a lot of the worst lawsuits, were brought by women in the first century CE. So in the time of the New Testament, there was a revolution going on. Women were getting new legal freedoms. They were getting new financial freedoms. And unfortunately, they decided to copy the men and have new sexual freedoms. Now, I say copy the men because the men could always have mistresses as long as they didn't bring them home. Uh, Augustus, so the Emperor Augustus, didn't set a very good example. He wanted to make a new morality in the empire, but everyone knew he had mistresses, and when he got too old to go out to find them, his wife went out to find them for him. Ah, but his daughter, his daughter had to be pure and had to be moral, and she wasn't. I don't know if you know about Julia. Uh, she went around playing the post prostitute all around the cities of Rome, uh, all around the um, markets in Rome, and uh, she, it was an absolute scandal. In the end, Augustus had to banish her for the, her lewd behaviour. Uh, the women rebelled against these laws, and they said, we want the same freedom in sexual terms as the men. And it could be said that by the end of the first century, men and women in the Roman world were equal. They had both come down to the same level. And what did, what did the moral philosophers do about this? What did the leaders of religion do about this? The moral philosophers, they tried to stem this change by uh, going back nostalgically to the morals of Aristotle in the 4th century BCE. He was teaching that society stands on the family. The whole of society stands or falls on the strength of this unit called the family. I think I've heard that somewhere else recently. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, that was his idea. It was his big idea. It uh, wasn't the modern politicians. And he said that the family structure is... Oh, I, I must tell you, his, his disciples are called peripatetics. We're not quite sure why, but we assume it's because of his habit of teaching, walking like this, walking up and down under the colonnades as he's teaching and thinking. And of course, the poor disciples had to go running after him to keep up with him to hear what he's saying. So they were called the peripatetics, the, the walking disciples, as they were forever following him around. He, he started teaching a new subject, household management. So this was a brand new branch of philosophy in the fourth century. It's, um, it was partly economics. But he made it branch out into uh, the relationships within the family, household management, how you manage your wife, how you manage your children, and very importantly, how you manage your slaves. And in the first century BCE, just before the New Testament, this became a very important area because it was uh, revived by Andronicus of, uh, yeah, of Rhodes, uh, who collected together all of Aristotle's works and published them, and they became common property. A lot of people knew the things in Aristotle. They wouldn't actually have read his works, but it would have been discussed in the marketplaces. Also, it was a debating area. When a new philosopher came to town, it was like a new film opening at the local cinema. Everyone would gather to go and hear him. And they'd pay to go and hear the philosophers talking, because they had such wonderful rhetoric, and they were excited about what they were saying. And... Uh, uh, a sort of debating topic you would often give a philosopher is, should I marry? Or how should I organize my household? This, this was the area of Aristotle that they were always talking about. So you find a lot of Aristotle's ideas in the mind of first century people, and you find them in the New Testament. 
But this verse in uh, Ephesians 5. Husbands should love their own wives like their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh. Uh, uh, the whole argument here is based on two assumptions, which we gloss over because we're so used to this passage. But you imagine reading it for the first time, you think, it, this assumes that loving your wife is like loving yourself. Now, actually, I can think of quite a few people who don't love their wives as much as themselves. And the other assumption, no one hates himself. Unfortunately, I can also think of quite a few people who do hate themselves and sometimes harm themselves because they loathe themselves so much. Somehow, those two assumptions were in people's minds so much that when Ephesians was written, they could assume that anyone reading that would say, oh yes, 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 I agree with that. And you, it's because those two assumptions were both in Aristotle's argument for why you are allowed to be the judge, jury, and executioner for your own household, part of the Roman law, which was difficult to justify. And he justified it by saying, well, the, the, there's no such thing as injustice in the absolute sense towards what is one's own, one's own chattel, i.e. wife or child, until he reaches a certain age and becomes independent, because they are, as it were, part of oneself, and no one would choose to harm oneself. He's using those two same assumptions, and they are there in the ethos, and so much part of the ethos that when Ephesians is written, then the, the writer can just assume, oh dear, you're not academics, are you? I don't have to say the writer of Ephesians. I can say Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Paul can assume that the people understand these assumptions. It's just part of what they knew. So when the New Testament is written, everyone knows about Aristotle's uh, household management. They know about the structure that he had. You have the man as the head of the household and underneath him you have the wife and the children and the slaves. And that forms a unit of politics which forms the strength and structure of the whole city-state. Uh, these um, th these ideas uh, are often found in the New Testament as you know. And in the first century it was... Oh, I've lost myself completely here. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Um, Ar Aristotle's ideas were quite complicated. When you read through his book on politics, he goes through each of these relationships in great detail. Uh, in summary, the wife is the one who controls everything inside the house. She's the oikodemos. She's the um, a despot over the household, if you like. Uh, she spends all his money. Uh, and the, the man doesn't have control over his own money. He earns the money. But the wife controls everything inside the house, and she spends it all, and she decides what the house is going to do. She decides the timetable of the house. She decides what festivals are going to be, uh, how the festivals are going to be celebrated, and who's going to be invited. Everything that goes on, on inside the house. But she doesn't decide anything outside the house. Uh, by the way, Paul agreed with that. He said that in Timothy, the wife is the oikodemos. Somehow it doesn't get translated like that, but that's what he means. The, the wife is the one in charge of the house. If you're a woman, you should be spending all the money. If your husband wants something, he has to ask you. <laughs> well, that's the Aristotle's um, uh, model, and uh, Paul seems to agree with it by using that technical term, oikodemos. Uh, the slaves, they're the main workforce in society, and so managing them, of course, is very, very important for gaining that wealth that you have. And children, they're the guardian for the future. And all three of those work in subjection to the head of the household, and that's how society works well. And so you've got three complex relationships which are worked out in great detail with many nuances. But one of Aristotle's geniuses is that he can codify all that into a nice, simple structure. As he says, the fewest possible relationships of a household are master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. And we therefore have to examine the character of each of these three relationships. And he does that going through in, in the, the five books of politics. And then he says, um, the science of household management has these three divisions. The one relationship of master to slave, the paternal relationship and the conjugal relationship. And all that is part of the household science as to rule over the wife, etc. Et so Aristotle uh, summarizes it all very nicely. You have this family code, wives, subject yourselves to your husbands, children, subject yourselves to your father, slaves, submit to your master in all things. And that's how society works. I, I think perhaps you recognize these words, do you? <laughs>
<laughs> ah, right. Well, you, you are now like a first century Christian who's reading one of the epistles for the first time. And you come across these and you think, hang on, I know those words. These aren't the words of Paul. These are the words of Aristotle as codified by Andronicus of Rhodes. We don't actually have the direct source of... Oh, oh dear, oh dear. They, these are the three women in my life. I, I say, let's, let's take a picture of us at the campsite where we are. And they take the opportunity to scoff into the, the <laughs> strawberries and cream. And by the time I've taken the photograph, there are three strawberries left. Yeah. There we are, that's submission, eh? <laughs> But they, these um, uh, three phrases, they're not only cited by uh, Paul and by Peter in the New Testament, they're also cited by Jewish authors like Philo and Josephus. And uh, they treat them in exactly the same way, as we'll see. We don't have the original source in uh, uh, Aristotle. Maybe he wrote it, I think, more likely the original source is in Andronicus of Rhodes, who wrote big commentaries on Aristotle. Unfortunately, we don't have those commentaries anymore. It's a codified form that we have. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, submit to your father. And slaves, submit to your masters in all things. And we find those in the New Testament and in uh, other writings. But let's see how it occurs in the New Testament. Let's see in Ephesians. I've put there in blue. Can you actually see it in blue? Yes, you can, yes. Uh, ig ignore the squirrely bits of writing. That's um, so, um, it's a foreign language, which I don't really understand very well. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands. That's the quote. And then after that, you have a commentary on that, written by Paul, or whoever wrote Ephesians, if there's a scholar here. <laughs> and the commentary, the Christian commentary he adds is, that we, that is just like the church submits to the Lord. And he also adds, oh, by the way, husbands, you should love your wives sacrificially, mm. even as Christ died for the church. Then he quotes uh, Aristotle again, children, be obedient to your parents. And then he adds a Christian commentary, which I've paraphrased here, so that you'll live long, getting that from the Old Testament, of course. And then he says, oh, by the way, fathers, uh, you should discipline your children, but without irritating them. Or as one translation, without exasperating them. I love that. Yes. Well, my children love it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then finally quoting, slaves, be obedient to your lords in all things. And then the Christian commentary, uh, do this sincerely. Don't just obey your masters because you've got to. Do it sincerely, as if you're obeying the Lord. Oh, and by the way, masters, remember that you too have a master in heaven. And uh, these really are your brothers. So quoting Aristotle, saying, this is what we're going to try and do, but we have certain misgivings about this. Uh, we can only take it so far. Uh, we, the, we, the husband should also be... Uh, Loving sacrificially, and at the beginning of that passage, of course, being subject to the wife as well. And fathers, uh, children should be obeying, but fathers, you should be... Actually, it says about teaching the children. This is interesting, because the teachers of children would normally be the slaves. You would hire a slave to teach your son or your daughter. Uh, and here, a father is supposed to be getting involved with the work which a slave would normally do. This is very interesting. And slaves, be obedient to your laws and all things, but... And we have exactly the same thing in Colossians, of course. Wives, subject yourselves to your husbands. The commentary there is, subject as to the Lord and husbands, love without anger. Uh, children, be obedient to your parents, same quote. And then different commentary, uh, for this pleases God and fathers don't exasperate them. Very similar, of course. And slaves, be obedient in sincerity. And masters, be fair, because God is your master. In First Timothy, we have the same quotations, uh, well, they're virtually the same. Let a woman learn in silence with full submissiveness. And then a completely different commentary. For Eve was deceived, and male teachers should be sober and learned. I, I'm very convinced by what Kina has written on this passage, where it says that this is an appeal for women to be educated. Eve was deceived from lack of education. And uh, certainly that does come out uh, when you read the Greco-Roman background. Um, then having children in submissiveness again, uh, then the Christian commentary, very different. If a father cannot preside over them, how can he lead a church? A father in those days was supposed to be uh, the um, legal, well, not just legal guardian, uh, you were supposed to be the judge and jury and executioner for your children. You were even allowed to impose a death penalty on your children under Roman law, which hadn't been repealed by the first century. And if 
you're, if you were supposed to be responsible for your children under law like that, if they did something wrong, you were supposed to put it right. And of course, by the first century, the kids had run riot. There, and there's no way you could touch them. This law hadn't been repealed, but really it was toothless. There was no one executed by a, fa by a head of household after the turn of the millennium. No one in the first century. And it's, it was a toothless law, and yet everyone expected you to obey it. So if a, a, a church leader had a child who was running amok, the church leader was the one who was criticised, not the children, because he was legally responsible. Oh, uh, it was very difficult. And, and slaves, consider your masters worthy of all honour. Uh, and the commentary here is, this is for the gospel's sake. And believing masters, remember that they are your brothers. Wow. Telling people that your slaves, the people you own, the people you can have sex with without any permission, the people you can beat but not to death, uh, you, they are actually your brothers. They are your equals. That's a very severe Christian commentary. It almost negates what Aristotle has said. But still, they're quoting Aristotle and then putting this commentary on. Uh, in Titus, young women su should subject themselves to their husbands. Here the commentary is for the gospel's sake. And also, young men, by the way, don't speak so crudely. This was uh, in, in Crete where they had very crude language. Uh, slaves, you should subject, uh, slaves should subject themselves to their own masters in all things. Then the Christian commentary, not arguing and not stealing. You Christian slaves, stop stealing. Can you imagine you had to tell them that? For the sake of the gospel. And then 1 Peter, not just Paul, Peter as well. How servants should subject themselves to their masters in all fear. And the Christian commentary is not just the subject yourselves to the good masters, but also to the ones who are going to abuse you. Because Christ suffered, we should suffer like him. And wives too should subject themselves to their husbands. Uh, why? To convert non-believers. That's the Christian commentary. That, 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 that's how it is in the New Testament. Five different occasions where the Aristotelian moral code is quoted with caveats, with a commentary, with a but. And you find exactly the same thing in Jewish writings. Here in Philo, in the Hypothetica, this is an apologetic work. He wants to present Judaism as a good religion which is helping the moral fibre of society and not leading people astray, as many Romans thought. And he says, uh, servants must submit to their masters. That bit is missing, actually. Uh, it isn't quoted by Eusebius, so we have to assume it's there, because the rest is there. But masters must not sexually mistreat them. Wives must be in servitude to their husbands, but husbands must not violently mistreat them. Parents have authority over their children, but it's to keep them safe and to treat them gently. And again, in uh, Josephus, uh, again, an apologetic work, Contra Appian, where he's telling them how good Judaism is, how the law of Moses is just like the Greek law, just like the Roman law, and it's, uh, we should all become Jews. Uh, and uh, then he says, well, what does the law of Moses say about families? Well, the law of Moses says, let the wife be obedient, uh, and let children honour their parents. And uh, the, the, he doesn't actually give that bit about let slaves submit, but he does give the but, which is exactly the same but that we find in Philo in that place. Masters must not sexually mistreat the, the, his, their slaves. So we have this same Aristotelian threefold law. Quoted, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> they, they give you this bit of uh, fruit to put in your mouth, and then they lead a camel over to you, and this camel grabs it out of your mouth. So there's a picture of me kissing a camel. <laughs> He's hairy. <laughs> yes. right, anyway, the, the, the code of Aristotle, a very nice simple code. Man is the head of a household, wife, children, slaves underneath. And the Christian writers in the New Testament are saying, let's keep this code. Why? Why on earth should they keep this code? Especially when they have so many problems with it, as the commentary on that code indicates. Why are the Jews keeping this code when there's obviously such big problems? We can make some guesses. If a, a woman comes to your church and she's wearing a miniskirt slightly broader than a belt and fishnet stockings, what do you think of her? Mm -hmm. Or, if a woman in America goes into a bar by herself, what's she gone there for? For lemonade? For a drink? For sex? It's an assumption, of course. There's nothing wrong with fishnet stockings, except for the people who wear them. There's nothing wrong with going into a bar by yourself. It's just 
the other people who do the same thing. And there was nothing wrong with not submitting to your husband. We are free in Christ. We have equality. There's no male or female, no slave, no master. But when society sees that the wife isn't submitting, when the society sees that the slave in that household is on equality with the master, they're going to assume that those women, those slaves, are taking their freedoms like the other women are doing sexually. They're taking that freedom to the degree. And so that's just the way it would seem. A generation ago, women couldn't wear lipstick because it would be assumed that she's trying to attract a man who wasn't her husband. Nothing wrong with wearing lipstick, I understand. But it, or, or what if a man wears, wears lipstick nowadays? You would assume that he's gay and trying to attract a mate. But there's nothing wrong with a man wearing lipstick. But you would assume that. What, what would you assume if two men going to a conference shared a bedroom together? You can't do it nowadays. Because you just assume, oh, well, there's a sexual liaison going on there. Whereas it always used to happen a generation ago. We have to be careful what people are going to think about us. We have to be careful what we do, because people will say, aha, you see, they're just like the rest of them. And that's what was happening in the first century. When a woman showed that she wasn't in submission to her husband, they said, aha, she's one of them. She's one of those new Roman women who are taking lovers into her bed and uh, being free and everything else. So the Aristotelian family code was very important to demonstrate that Christianity and Judaism, the Jews also were quoting this, was a moral religion. That they were striving to put moral values into society. But Christians and Jews could only take it so far. And uh, there, there, there were problems with it. Anyway, we don't have to think of, and guess about why they did it, because people in the New Testament were asking the same questions. And uh, in Peter, we hear the servants who are saying, why on earth should I submit to my master who beats me every morning just because his breakfast isn't warm enough? Servants, subject yourselves to your master with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. And we should be examples to the rest of the world. And as a good witness, we should suffer as Christ suffered. And, and it, the wives, similarly, they're asking, why on earth should I submit to my husband, who really is a fat slob? And he says, similarly, you wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if they don't obey the word, they may, without a word, be won over by the behaviour of their wives. You can silently win them over to the faith by showing that you are more moral now as a Christian than you were before. But if you're not following even the basic ideas of morality in society, they're going to assume you've learned immorality from that church that you're attending now. Also, people will just curse the gospel if we don't follow the basic morals. Wives should be in subjection to their husbands, this is in Titus, we should be in subjection to their own husbands so that the word of God be not blasphemed. And similarly with um, slaves, 1 Timothy 6. Let those who are servants under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, so that the name of God and the doctrine will not be blasphemed. You can imagine someone um, whose uh, servant has become a Christian. He's been going off to the church services <laughs> late on a Saturday night. And uh, he comes back a new person. And when his master asks him to do something stupid, he says, No, there is no slave or free from Christ. And that master is going to curse Christ because of his servant. And he's going to tell his neighbours, ever since my servant went off to that Christian church, he's come back obstreperous, argumentative, he doesn't obey me, he, he's a terrible person, and no doubt he's stealing from me as well, and he's probably sleeping with my wife. And they're going to assume the worst because you're not obeying the basic morality. And that's what happens. And Paul and Peter have to tell their flock, look, wives, submit to your husbands in public. Children, obey your parents. Slaves, submit to your masters, even when they're being violent, even when they're being stupid, so that the gospel is not blasphemed. All right, here's a question for us.
Oh, yeah, I don't think the situation is so different nowadays um, because we too have had the world wars which changed society. In the world wars, the men went off to fight and left the women behind. And the women couldn't stay in their houses anymore. They had to go out in the fields, they had to go off to the factories, they had to go and run government. And ever since then, women have had more and more authority in public. Now, there's been a lot of backlash from men. Men have felt threatened, men, men have felt intimidated. And uh, yeah, we're around about the situation where they were in um, uh, the first, first century BCE. But what should we do now? What should we do? Here's a question. This is a plenary session. In a plenary session, you're supposed to ask me questions, but I'm going to end with a question to you. If the early church followed Aristotle's moral code, as far as they could, in order to aid evangelism, which code should we follow in order to aid evangelism? Egalitarianism or complementarianism? Which one is going to make the converts? Because that's all we want. People in heaven.